we off today? Yes, no. Just here. Fair enough. Maybe uh, have someone grab me a microphone. I'll, I'll throw another. Uh, I'll just grab a black one. There are those days when gremlins live in the sound system. No doubt I won't blame the devil for everything, but the devil doesn't like what's happening here at First Baptist Church. He doesn't want the children of God to sing the praise of God and hear the word of God. I won't blame the microphone on the devil, but it's not sad that it's happening. Thankfully, the Lord allows us, allows us to have multiple microphones at First Baptist Church. And if that didn't work, I'd yell real loud and make you all come to the front. So you praise the Lord that I have a microphone this morning so you don't have to slide up front. Some of you ain't never seen the front of this building like you would at that point. Exodus chapter 20. So we begin this morning, again, focusing on our theme, only God. Been praying, studying, meditating on this concept, only, only God. Cannot help but have our hearts burdened when we look around us in the state of our land, in the state of the world, at the affairs of our own lives and know that we need something. We need something. Only God. 2020 came and went, and now 2021 does not seem to be much better yet. Only God. Bills come and go, Christmas comes and goes, and yet we wake up to the same job and the same situation. Only God. Exodus chapter 20 is an interesting and fairly well-known passage of Scripture, not because you may identify Exodus 20, but the content of Exodus 20, you would be, you're almost everyone here would be more than familiar with. It's a portion of Scripture where we gain our knowledge of the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, even those who are not saved know of the Ten Commandments. Maybe not in the right order, all of them specifically, but we know that we don't want them put up in our courthouses. We don't want them in the town square. We don't want any mention of God in the public sphere and inspector. This morning I'd like to take our draw our attention to just the first part of the 10 commandments. The book of Judges have been in there that portion of scripture in my Bible reading. In Judges chapter 2 the Bible tells me and tells us that the children of Israel after they'd been delivered from the, from the bondage of Egypt and seen the provision of God, wandered for 40 years, they're now in the promised land. They've now been, some, have some victories. They left worshiping and following only God. Judges tells me this, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Throughout the book of Judges, we will find this pattern over and over. God's people began to serve, worship, bow down to a false god. God Almighty sends prophets and judges and judgments to the children of Israel. The children of Israel then repent and say, we're sorry, turn back to God. And a short while later, a few years later, they again go and worship false gods. Again, God will say, all right, I will then deliver you to the fruit of your own decisions. You will reap what you've sown. You've sown to the flesh. You'll have the flesh reap corruption. You want to serve these gods, it brings bondage. And for the children of Israel, often in a physical sense of the word bondage, they again cry to the Lord. God sends a deliverer, a judge, the book of Judges. And yet a short while later, 20, 40 years, again the children of Israel reject God. Somehow, in our time, we don't believe that we ever worship false gods. We're in church, so obviously we only worship God. We're a Christian. We claim the name of Christ, so we would never succumb to anything else in that. If you would, look with me, please, in Exodus chapter number 20, where God began to 
really explain and to instruct the children of Israel his expectations on worship of him. In Exodus 20, verse number 1, And God spake all these words, saying... The first verse tells us that this was not Moses' idea. This was not man's idea. This right here was God's idea. This morning, as I preach about this particular concept, only God, please, though at times I may give an opinion, follow God's truth. This is not merely my idea. This is His idea. If it steps on some toes, understand the Lord delights in stepping on our flesh, our toes. Because if we respond to Him, it makes us to become more like Him and more like His Son, Jesus Christ. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in heaven or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this time, and I'd ask that you would help us now. You'd help us, first of all, Lord, to listen to your spirit and your word this morning. Lord, would you challenge us? Lord, help me as I speak. I have tried to prepare and study and do my part, but Lord, I need you this morning. I cannot communicate this truth apart from you. But Lord, meet with us this morning. Would you touch us and change us? And Lord, if there's an area in our life that's not given to you, Lord, please help us to respond to you this morning. Lord, if there's someone here who's not saved and never trusted you for their salvation, I would ask that today they would trust you this morning. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. God says, in leading off the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord. And thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other gods should we worship in thought, in deed, or action. I've had the privilege of going to a few countries on mission trips. I was uh, in um, Cambodia with Brother Rupal. And there they have other gods, physical gods. There I can see people actually taking little incense sticks and lighting them to a false god. Yet here in America, we don't have much of that physical representation. I don't go to too many homes in Saginaw, Michigan, where I find people having an altar with an idol, a a, a Buddha, or, or some other pagan god there. But that doesn't mean that they don't worship some other god. And here, if I can direct your attention to this particular idea, this concept this morning, primarily God is speaking to the children of Israel, to His people, to His chosen people. And He says, for His people, don't have any other gods before me. And I hope that you've trusted Christ as your Savior. I hope you're a Christian, a child of God. If you're not, I'm here to tell you this morning that God loves you and Jesus died for you. But my friend, my fellow Christian, I'm here to challenge you as well this morning to not have any other God before God Almighty. You say, well, pastor, of course I don't. I have the Bible on my phone, I have the Bible at home, and the Bible in my car. I'm here at church on a Sunday morning, and pastor, I've been here every single Sunday in the month of January. Of course, I don't have any other gods before God Jehovah. Don't you know that I can sing all the songs from memory? I don't even need the words on the screen. I don't have any other gods before him. And I'm afraid, my friend, I'm afraid that we as Christians, I just know about here, that sometimes we have other gods before Jehovah. In the Bible, in the book of Judges, we'll find some of the Israelites' gods listed the ones they chose to follow besides Jehovah, the God that we worship. One was called Baal. It seemed to be the one that would 
trip up the children of Israel the most. Seemed to be that Baal seemed to be the major god. If they were going to turn to a god, Baal was the first god they would turn to. Apparently a god of the Philistines and a lot about Baal. I'm not going to detail about Baal, but it was, he was a pagan false god filled with, with sexuality, with lust, and wickedness. And they'd have an altar built up to him. They would give him credit. Along the way, they picked up a few other gods. They, at times, would worship a god the Bible refers to as Molech. M-O-L-E-C-H, Molech. A particularly devious false god. He asked for the sacrifice of children. And they would, the Bible tells us, sometimes even sacrifice their own children to a false god. And we step back from that and read that and say, wow, that's horrible. That's terrible. I can't imagine bowing down and worshiping a false god. Hey, sorry, Pastor, got to go. I'm going to work. I'm going to work, Pastor. Sorry, I can't make it. I'm, I've got some work to do. I've got to make money. How many Christians follow the false god of money? as the highest priority in their life. You see, a false god, a god in your life, is one that you will follow and submit to. That's a god. One that you will cling to and worship. And I wonder, in 2021, in the United States of America, how many people and how many Christians worship the god of money? What drives them? What motivates them? What energizes them is making sure their finances are just right. You say, well, I'm not trying to make so much money. I just need to provide for my family. So I have to make this money. Now, you ought to provide for your family, men. The Bible talks about that. But I provide for my family not to provide for my family. I provide for my family because God has commanded me to, to entirely different reasons. So that if God tells me where to go, I go. It's not just about my family. It's about Him. It was years ago. I was a youth pastor at First Baptist Church. I had a young teenager who didn't come to church Wednesday night because they had a shift at McDonald's. I asked him, I said, do you have to work? No, I picked up the shift. I said, how much are you going to make tonight? And they told me at that time, I believe the minimum wage was around like $7.25 an hour. We figured out for their three-hour shift after taxes, they would bring home around a $17 to $18. And that shift at McDonald's was more important than worshiping God. Worshiping God, the God of money. But that's not the only God we have in 2021 in America. How about the God of education? We exalt this, the, the, the most, the, 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 what we want is the knowledge to know something. And this is most important. And I've got to exalt education. And if you're smart, I listen to you. If you're not educated, I don't listen to you. The God of education. And while we may not bow down to the God of Baal, we sometimes bow down to the God of education. And that's the most important thing. Or how about the God of science? We follow science as the highest priority in our life. I'm for science. I particularly like math better than science, but it's okay. I'm weird that way. But science can't be the highest God in my life. It must be Jehovah. Or how about the God of nationalism? There are a few things that I will steer clear of sometimes at church. Typically, I steer clear of some pandemic things and... Uh, Politics. I do that on purpose, typically. I'll tell you why. I'm not afraid to go there. But typically, I, I view church as a, rel as a small oasis from life. We worship God. But don't get me wrong. If you have not heard how to vote by faith, go back. There's, it's on YouTube right now, how to vote with your faith and by your faith. Your faith in God should dictate how you vote. Okay? It's, it's on YouTube. You go listen to it. Not right now. Not right now. But I know people, I know Christians who are driven, who are energized, and who are passionate more about politics than they are about the Bible. 
They get more riled up listening to someone talk about politics in a talk show perhaps or a commentator or something that comes across. They're more energized by that. They react to that more than they do God's word. You tell me who they really worship. You see, who you worship, you invest in. Who you worship, you spend time thinking about. Who you worship, you submit to. You change your schedule for whom you worship. Who you worship, you follow. Who you worship, you, you love. Who you worship, you find passion for. There are others who find their God in the God of family. Family is the highest priority. In fact, you know, we're not going to come to church tonight. We're going to have family time. Now, you ought to have family time. We have family time at our house. We often, each week, or often have a night called family night. And family night, the kids get to often decide the menu. Sometimes I make the judgment call and say, this is what I want tonight. But often they decide the menu, what we want to eat, and we have some specific family activity, family night. I want my family to be close to each other. But my family is not my highest priority. And I know Christians whose highest priority is their family. It's a false god. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we can look at someone else's false gods. We look at the, the Israelites and, and Baal and say, that's terrible. And Molech, that's awful. But I protect my God. Don't talk about mine. For some, it's safety and comfort. And that's the highest priority. For some, it's beauty. What a temporary false god. But they live for how they look. False god. Don't tell me that we don't have false gods in 2021. We do. Someone said it this way, that our hearts are idle factories. Constantly churning out, building, designing, and exalting a multiplicity of gods. These gods that our heart churns out threaten the very essence of our spirituality. And you may say, well, pastor, you know what? I'm not struggling with money, and I'm not struggling with family. But you know what your heart is leading you away from, or leading you to away from God. Our hearts are idle factories. Many who have claimed the name of Jesus Christ have exalted something other than him in their life. They claim God, but you look at their life and you see other actions, materialism, friendship, science, education, beauty, money, or family. These gods find our, their way into our homes, uh, our churches, and our lives. And we are called. No, it's expected, even demanded, that we would have no other gods before him. How watchful we should be in this earth. Where the false gods are not only plenty, but exactly after the fashion of our own depraved hearts. There's a city, well, the city of Athens. Paul went there. It was said of Athens that in every corner and every day you could find a new God. Someone else said in the city of Athens there was more gods than there were citizens of the city of Athens. And I would imagine, if we're honest, that there are times there are more gods than there are citizens. And this morning, I'm going to ask us to make sure that in our heart, in your heart, in your life, there is no other God. Let's look here at the scripture where the Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse number one, And God spake all these words, saying, Verse number two, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I wonder this morning, do you have a priority for only God? There was an old recipe for rabbit stew. I've never had rabbit stew. Please, if you're a hunter, don't bring me a rabbit. I don't want to try rabbit stew. There's an old recipe for rabbit stew, and it began this way. First, catch the rabbit. That's pretty good advice, isn't it? First, catch, if you're going to have rabbit stew, make sure you first catch the rabbit. I was driving down Dixie Highway this morning and saw some birds on the side of the road, and there was another deer on the side of the road. 
They are out again. I have a, I have a knack for, for getting those deer. I can't seem to get them out hunting, but out driving, I'm a pro. You have hunting stories, I got driving stories. Boy, rabbit stew. In a, a, week or, a week or two ago in our school, uh, Miss Evans asked the students to give instructional things. My wife's done the same thing, and they'll ask these students, give instructions how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I watched Doreen's class, these first graders give the instructions, and my wife will actually do the instructions. And boy, if you start to actually write out the instructions, they normally get it wrong the first time. And she'll do exactly what they say, take the jelly. My wife will stick her hand inside the jelly jar. Oh, no, 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 get a knife. Oh, get a knife, all right. And, and uh, take the peanut butter, and she'll reach in there, grab that, and put it on the bread, and she'll take her hand, just smear it on the bread. Sometimes, Christians, we miss the obvious. Thou shalt have no other gods. You have to start with him. Don't forget to catch the rabbit first. No other gods. A priority for God. He tells us why he's a priority. He says, I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. I am the self-existing one. In case you forgot who I was, children of Israel, I am the one who is in all things, who made all things, who supports and, and, and is in all things, the self-existing one. I am the Lord. And my friend, this morning, you can worship a whole lot of false gods, but there is only one Jehovah. There's only one self-existing one. There will only be one God who will be here a hundred million years from now, and his name is Jehovah. Everything else we worship will be gone. Every dollar that we made or not make, every comfort we think we have right now, everything will be gone except for God himself. I am the Lord thy God. He says, worship me because I'm worthy of your worship. Everything else is just a cheap substitute used to on the senior trips go to New York City New York City in Battery Park at that time people would come up, come up to you and they'd ask questions like this do you want to buy a pair of Oakley's now Oakley is a sunglass manufacturer they make some nice sunglasses in fact I have a pair of Oakley's at home right now Oakley's will often cost you a hundred or more to two hundred dollars for just a pair of sunglasses but wouldn't you know it these guys that would come up to me in New York City in Battery Park they would sell one for fifteen dollars where'd they get those genuine Oakley's I tend to be a, a barterer my wife does not like this aspect about me she won't go with me if I go to buy something from Facebook marketplace we have a good understanding. She stays home or in the vehicle. She can't talk. It's, it's my job, all right? And I get these guys down to two and three dollars a piece for sunglasses. Well, two or three bucks, I can, I can take a pair of genuine Oakleys. <laughs> they also, they'd open up their coat and they'd have Rolexes. Now, Rolexes can run you $10,000 and upwards for a nice watch. I mean, and beyond $10,000. And you know, for like 40 bucks, you can get a genuine Rolex. Now, I've never touched a real Rolex. I'm told that a real Rolex, the, the second hand, will be very smooth. These ones must have been made differently because they just ticked like a normal watch. I'm told that real Rolexes are very reliable and that the ones that I would buy from these guys in Battery Park, they'd last two or three days or a week even, and then they'd quit working. Then they'd have purses. Coach, Gucci, I think it was the other purse they had there. And I could buy my wife a purse that would normally be $300, $400 for $30. Husband of the year. <laughs> Except you get back and the stitching's a little bit different and uh, can't really find the pattern maybe that is shown online, the one they have there. And, and uh, Coach is spelled with a K. Oh, they'll tell you it's genuine. They'll tell you it's real. And you'd have them for a fraction of the cost. But you and I both know that those things that they were offering to me were merely cheap substitutes. You know what? Those sunglasses, they would still block the sun a little bit. 
They would till they snapped apart and broke. Those watches would tell you the time until they stopped ticking. And those purses would hold stuff inside of them until the zippers broke and the stitching came apart. Just like every false god in your life. For a little bit of time, it'll block the sun a little bit. For a little bit of time, it'll hold the essence of your life. For a little bit of time, it'll tell you the direction to go. But ultimately, it will fail because they're nothing but a cheap substitute and counterfeit. Thou shalt have no other gods. Why? First reason, because I'm the real thing. I am the Lord. Do you want something fake or do you want something real? Listen, if you want something fake, I can get you a pair of Oakleys. I would tend to get pretty good deals, but every once in a while, along throughout the years, I'd have a, a student who I would tell him, listen, if you wanted to buy something, they're fake, but I'll help you get a better deal. Some want to do it themselves. And they'd come and show me, look, Pastor, Pastor J.D., they'd say, look what I got. I said, how much did you pay for that Rolex? And they'd tell me the amount, and I would shudder on the inside. And they'd say, well, I got it for X amount of money, but he started at this point. I really got him down. I paid for these glasses, $20, and he started at $40. I got a great deal. And I'd show them mine. How much did you pay? $3. Worship God, follow God, because he's... The only genuine one. And secondly, this morning, he says this in verse number 2. I'm the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. We ought to worship God. He must be the priority, not only because he is the only true God, but because he has liberated us. He's the Lord, and he's liberated us. God deserves the priority because he has saved me. He has rescued me, just like he did to the children of Israel. I was bound by the chains of sin and darkness. I was servant to sin. But because of Jesus Christ and his blood shed on the cross, I am now free. And if the Son hath made you free, you shall be free indeed. And God said, worship me because I brought you out of bondage. You were a slave, and now you're not any longer. Jesus is the only one who knew what I would be like. Jesus is the only one who knew how I would act. Jesus is the one who loved me when I was a sinner, who loves me through my frailty, who understands my greatest weakness, who upholds me when I'm lacking strength, who, can, who comforts me when I'm hurting and discouraged. And his name is Jesus. He's the sweetest name I know. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, name above all names. He's rescued me from the bondage of sin and Satan. He's delivered me from the fires of hell, and he removes from me the charge of sinful corruption grants me the keys of grace to live a sanctified life. This morning, I wonder what other God you have in your life. What other priority do you have in your life? man's name was Pasquier. He's 67 years old. He's a retired ornithologist. Study birds. Study birds. You're welcome. I had to look it up. I had no idea. But that's not what he's famous for this morning. This morning, I want to draw your attention to what he does almost every day now. And he finds coins on the streets of New York City. He's done this since 1987. He's found more than $2,000 worth of coins a few years back now. He has developed strategy, strategies and implemented scientific methods to keep track of loose coins and where they sit. He targets careless people and avoids on eye contact with other pedestrians because he's focused only on looking for dropped coins. He became adept at the sound of he said, of a coin when it falls. Apparently, he can identify even what coin it is when it falls. But that's not what caught my attention. What caught my attention was when he said, talking about this particular coin finding idea, when he really began to make some money. In 2007, 
2007, he said, I began to make a lot of money because it was the introduction of the iPhone. He said, at that time, my annual takings nearly doubled because most people were too busy staring at their phones to notice coins on the street. I wonder, in our life, what causes us to be distracted. If you seek the Lord, you'll find Him. If you look after Him with your heart and soul, have a passion for Him, you'll find Him. The question is not if we're looking for Him. It's if we're only looking for Him. So many false gods. Family, money, nationalism. Only one true God. And God says, Thou shalt have no other gods. Lord, I'd ask this morning you'd search our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to identify if in our life, as a Christian, we've allowed something or someone else to take your place. Lord, we, want, we don't want to be guilty of idol worship. But Lord, help us this morning. One of this morning who would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. As you were speaking, God was speaking to my heart. And I need to do business with him. Would you pray for me this morning? I would say, that's me. Would you slip your hand up for me? Amen. Amen. Hands all over. Who else? God spoke to me this morning. Amen. I wonder if you're here this morning. You say, Pastor, you talked about being saved. I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. But I'd like to know more about that. Would you pray for me? I'm not saved. I've never trusted Jesus Christ. But I'd like to know more about that. Would you pray for me this morning? Now, before you slip your hand up, I'll draw no more attention to you than did anyone else. But I'd love to pray for you this morning. Who would say, that's me, Pastor. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip it up, slip it back down. I'll see you. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know the heart. Lord, you know that you are the only God that's worthy of our worship. Lord, help us this morning to respond to you the way we ought to. In Jesus' name, amen.